Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to our journey through Dietrich Bonhoeffer's spiritual classic, Life Together. This is session seven, and I gave it the title of Living in Truth, Living Among Sinners. We have come to the final chapter of Bonhoeffer's uh, Life Together. Uh, the chapter's title is called Confession and the Lord's Supper. Um, but just as um, the first chapter of Life Together, community, is just so full of important concepts that are so relevant to what Christian community looks like uh, for us today, I find that the final chapter, likewise, um, really does a fabulous job in lifting up concepts that are so foreign to us, such a struggle for us, and yet so important if we are going to have authentic Christian community as sisters and brothers in Christ today. And so we're only going to look at just a, a, a few, uh, few, few pages from the uh, uh, chapter called Confession and the Lord's Supper, um, but it's going to give us plenty of food to chew on as we ponder what this all means for us here today. And so uh, let's uh, go ahead and allow ourselves to clear our minds and to simply arrive at this time together to allow the Holy Spirit to, to open us up to what is going to be given to us by our, our brother Dietrich. Uh, though the, the Nazis sought to silence him, he was not silenced. And among the great cloud of witnesses, our brother Dietrich continues to witness to the gospel and teach us and guide us, pointing us toward Jesus Christ and pointing us toward what is possible for us um, as we live by grace. But let's just, just pause for a moment and ask for the Spirit's guidance in this process. Let us pray. Oh, gracious God, as we ponder once again uh, who you are and who we are, and as we allow ourselves to be challenged to live authentically in who we are, to no longer be afraid, to be honest about uh, um, where we are in this life and where we are in relationship with others and and give us a calling that shows that it's possible for us to remain authentic in the real lives that we do live together within Christian community. So guide us in this time of meditation and pondering. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, let's review uh, just a little bit from last time. It was the last chapter that we looked at um, the last time we gathered on service. And um, um, within that chapter, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer tells us that uh, um, it is within Christian community that sisters and brothers in Christ owe to one another these services. Uh, the first of those services is that we would listen to one another. We would offer to listen to a Christian sister, a Christian brother, right where they are, just as they are. And when the time comes that we notice that we can be of help and assistance, to be active in providing that kind of help to others. Also, being in relationship and community with others, we, we bear with them their struggles, their sorrows, their suffering, and their pain. We are right alongside of them in whatever it is they are going through. And then the most important service that we offer to others is to be a witness ourselves to the Word of God, that we be someone, um, a, a fellow child of God, follower of Jesus Christ, 
who shares the gospel, the good news, to the other Christian. Now, we spent a lot of time last uh, time that we met in session six, uh, recognizing that all of this is only possible if we do it from a place that Dietrich Bonhoeffer calls spiritual love. And I see that kind of love being a love in which, um, you know, the one that what you are loving is then something that you are projecting good upon. You desire good for that which you love. And so that's a that's the different from from emotional love, which looks to take from what you love something from them so that I feel good. <laughs> um, that makes me smile or or whatever it is. So you can say, I I love pizza, but you're not projecting good upon the pizza. I don't wish for the, the wellness of that pizza. <laughs> I wish to consume it so I feel good, so that my tummy feels good, right? Likewise, we could say that, it, you know, in terms of Christian community or, or my church, I love my church, but do I love my church because I go there and I feel good because of the songs that are sung, you know, because of the amazing message that I hear, uh, because of all these things and what they're doing to me? Or do I project good upon that community. Um, and so that begins to, by, by offering these very services that uh, uh, freely from a place of freedom that Bonhoeffer talks about. So, and we only can listen authentically. We can only actively help and bear one another and share the word from a place of spiritual love. So service within Christian community done from that place of spiritual love is possible because we stand in a position of freedom, okay? So since it isn't no longer, you know, dependent on me feeling good about that, which I love, you know, and I come, I take that good feeling from it, I am free to just be me <laughs> as I am to know that my value, my purpose, my power, my everything comes as a gracious gift from God and isn't taken from that which I love. Therefore, I'm free from having to judge the other. They can simply be as and, and honest as I listen to them. I'm free from being judged by the other, you know? And so, so I don't need to be concerned. What are they going to think of me? And even if they do think poor of me, that does not have power over me. I'm free from needing to project a phony facade born in our ego. I have this idea of how I am, <laughs> you know, and who I am and how I'm respected or how I'm admired or whatever it is. And so I got to project that so that I receive that kind of admiration and whatever from the other person. I don't need, I don't need any of that anymore. Because the idea that I have of myself is always going to come up short to the real self, to, to the, the me is the way that God sees me. You know, truly, I've heard this said before. I think it's even one of my, my post-it notes behind me. Salvation is coming to the place where you are able to see yourself as God sees you. I'll say that again. Salvation is arriving at the, a place where you are able to see yourself as God sees you. All right? So that's about being free from needing to project a phony facade, <laughs> which is born out of our ego. I'm free from having to make demands on the one being served. You know, no good deed goes unpunished. I mean, you know that, you know, so... If the one I'm being served isn't grateful or, oh, they would like it have done this way and not that way, you know, I don't have to hold a grudge. I don't have to do that. I don't have to project what I think they need, <laughs> even though they don't think they need it. Um, and so I'm free from that. I'm free from comparisons. I don't need to see myself as less than the other. I don't need to see myself as greater than the other. I am just me. 
and I'm free from seeking self through the actions and words of the other. I don't have to draw my value and my importance and my purpose on how the other sees me. So there's a whole lot of freedom that comes from living out of spiritual love. All right, now into this final chapter, Confession and the Lord's Supper uh, from uh, um, Life Together. In the final chapter of Life Together, Bonhoeffer begins by re-emphasizing the need and opportunity of remaining grounded in the real. Our real God creates real people. We meet our real God among real people and real people are sinners. So, uh, you know, I, what we're going to do here now is essentially in these first two pages of the chapter Confession and the Lord's Supper, every word, every sentence is worth pondering. And he begins in the first chapter by re emphasizing the fact that we are truly 100% sinners. As it says in Romans 3, we are all sinners and fall short of the glory of God. And, and so, uh, um, and, 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 okay, that's a, that's a hard thing to take if we're not used to it. But Bonhoeffer gives us a bit of an urgency in needing to come to a place where we do recognize it because it's what is true and what is real. And what we have learned so far is that God is a God who is real, who has created people who are real. And so to live in a place where we are not being real, in denial, well, living with the masks, with the facades, projecting something that isn't real about us, and then demanding that others look at us in that unreal way, um, you're no longer operating in what is real, and that means you're no longer operating in where God is, because God is among what is real. And so, again, the urgency here. And, and the spiritual possibility for us, challenge, but opportunity and possibility is that by engaging in practices like confession, where we are honest with ourselves and we are honest with where we are at, gives us now the possibility of actually encountering and being with God. We need to be real if we are going to be with God, because God is always going to be among that which is real. And so let's take a look at how that then relates to, uh, uh, to confession, all right? So he begins the chapter by, by quoting from James chapter five, confess your sins to one another. And then Bonhoeffer writes, those who remain alone in their evil are left utterly alone. And so already what Bonhoeffer is doing is if, if we don't acknowledge our sinfulness and we do not confess our sins, we remain in our sins, right? And if we remain in our sins, then we remain cut off, cut off from one another because we're no longer living in what is real and cut off from God. And to be cut off is to be left utterly alone. Bonhoeffer then lifts up that there are communities out there that he gives the term pious to, all right? To demand and remain in a pious community is to remain in one that demands perfections in the eyes of humans. And so, um, you know, the pious community is going to be all about the facades. It's going to be all about the what's for show. You know, I, I am going to look like I'm a pious person by how I bow, how I pray, the eloquence through which I pray, by the, the stickers that are on my car, um, by uh, uh, the t-shirts that I wear, 
or the fancy Sunday clothes that I wear or whatever it may be, you know, by the music I listen to. And it's particularly when there are others around who can hear me. Um, and then I fit in with the pious community. But looking like we're perfect in the eyes of something created by humans continues to, to uh, trap us in remaining alone with our evil. Nothing is changing actually within the heart. And so Bonhoeffer lifts up the pious community as being a great evil and a very dangerous thing. He writes, for the pious community permits no one to be a sinner. Hence, all have to conceal their sins from themselves and from the community. We are not allowed to be sinners. Many Christians would be unimaginably horrified if a real sinner were suddenly to turn up among the pious. And so we rem remain alone with our sin, trapped in lies and hypocrisy, for we are, in fact, sinners. <laughs> So sinners aren't allowed in the pious community. Do not let any of that ugliness of sin be exposed. Do not let it out. Don't let it slip. Guard yourself. Walk on those eggshells so gingerly. You know, you will be given an evil judgmental eye the moment that is exposed you will be thrown into the outer darkness, not by the Lord who judges you, <laughs> but by the community who now judges you. And of course, that is, um, you know, it it uh, uh, it is something that that is dangerous because you're not allowed to be real, as I've said already. But I think the most difficult thing as Bonhoeffer puts it that way for us, is, is that so much of the stereotypical view of Christian community is exactly that way. <laughs> it's why Bonhoeffer has to call out pious community here in this book. And now so many decades later, we live in a different time. And and Lord knows that that um, some of that is is gone by the wayside, I suppose. Um, but but it has it. Even within Christian community, quote unquote Christian community, when the ugliness of the pious community raises its head, you are not allowed to be authentic, and you have to follow the demands of what is expected of you. And that ends up being the goal. And the goal no longer is making disciples. The goal no longer is bringing people to forgiveness and life in following Jesus Christ. And so we remain alone in our sin trapped in lies and hypocrisy, or in fact, we are sinners. So even in the midst of a community of others who are doing a wonderful job projecting their facade, we are so utterly alone. Bonhoeffer continues, however, the grace of the gospel, which is so hard for the pious to comprehend, confronts us with the truth. It says to us, you are a sinner, a great unholy sinner. Now come as the sinner that you are to your God who loves you. For God wants you as you are, not desiring anything from you, a sacrifice, a good deed, but rather desiring you alone. <laughs> My child, give me your heart says in Proverbs 23, 26. God has come to you to make the sinner blessed. Rejoice. This message is liberation through truth. You cannot hide from God. There is nothing 
God desires more than simply your heart. Jesus seeks your heart. Not what you dress as. Not your perfect attendance to church services. Not that you utter and somehow can recite perfect doctrine in the way that somehow you've been told is the only right way. None of that is what God is looking for. <laughs> because again, where is God? What does God love? Who, who, who is God interested in? You. You. The real you. <laughs> God wants your real heart. God wants your real self. That is why he became a human being in the incarnation. It is why he suffered completely as any human would suffer, even death. And it is why through, through forgiveness, through grace, and through resurrection, uh, he offers a place for you within his great kingdom, within the loving community of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He's not looking for sacrifice. He's not looking for right words. He's not looking for what right dress. He's not looking for you to get the approval of those people who are 100% confident that they have the approval of God, that they have the authority to judge. He wants you. And that, that's, you know, Bonhoeffer writes, that's gospel. That's the gospel. And he wants you just as you are. The glory of God is a, 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 a sinner, as a person, you know, fully free in the gospel. That's the glory of God. And again, you can't hide from God. Remember, in him, we live and move and have our being. We don't hop on a, a ship like Jonah uh, to go to Tarshish because we're going to get away from God. <laughs> you know, no, you, you, you can't. You wouldn't be alive if it wasn't for God in your life. Bonhoeffer continues, all right? In the presence of Christ, human beings were allowed to be sinners, and only in this way could they be helped. Every pretense came to an end in Christ's presence. This was the truth of the gospel in Jesus Christ, the misery of the sinner and the mercy of God. The community of faith in Christ was to live in this truth. That is why Jesus gave his followers the authority to hear the confession of sin and to forgive sin in Christ's name. You know, so 1 Timothy 1, 15, Christ came to save sinners of whom I am foremost. And so, you know, as a sinner, you know, you are among those that God came to help through Jesus Christ, through mercy. Um, and, uh, uh, and that's where the community of Christ is to to live. Um, and 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 this is where Bonhoeffer now slides again to the practice of confession. This is given to the community now to have the authority to hear confession and to offer forgiveness so that within authentic Christian community grounded in spiritual love, um, that word of forgiveness can be shared, all right? So Christ makes us into the community of faith, and in that community, Christ made the other Christian to be a grace for us. Now each stands in Christ's place. In the presence of another Christian, I no longer need to pretend. In another Christian's presence, I am permitted to be the sinner that I am. For there alone in all the world, the truth and mercy of Jesus Christ rule. Other Christians stand before us as the sign of God's truth and grace. They have been given to us to help us. Another Christian hears our, our confession of sin in Christ's place, forgives our sins in Christ's name. Another Christian keeps the secret of our confession as God keeps it. When I go to another believer, I confess I am going to God. And so this gets back, uh, you know, thinking to the last chapter on service, you know, the most important um, um, service that we provide and do for the other Christian is the service of sharing the word of God. 
Well, this this is a part of that. Um, you know, the service of of listening and hearing the confession, and then being able to to provide a, a word of forgiveness. The, the gospel gracious living word that your sins are forgiven um again is is a it is the powerful service that Christians can and should provide you know for one another it's important it's an idea that comes to us from Martin Luther that um you know that we have been made in such a way through the cross and through the incarnation through our baptism and unity into Christ, we are as little Christs, is the term that, that Luther uses, to one another. And so when we hear that word of forgiveness, not just from a pastor, but yes, from it can be from a pastor, it ought to be from a pastor, but even from one another, you should hear that as God's word um, uh, to you. It is coming to you as if, from God, but but you know, and only this only comes to us in community, and um, um, and again, it only has power for us when it does come to us from community, because when we remain alone and cut off from community, um, and that can be alone under our bed or alone in the midst of two hundred people within a pious community. 200 people who um, I have to pretend I'm something that I'm not. Um, you remain in your sins. Well, you could say that, well, um, yeah, but but forgiveness, confession, that's between me and God. And sure, you can pray right now, oh Lord, I confess my sins and, and I feel great shame for what I did yesterday. And you can name that to God in your prayer. But, but the word of forgiveness that you receive in a prayer is not going to have the power and the authority that you get when you hear it from another person. And that is a, a psychological reality in, in, in terms of us as human beings. And it is a spiritual reality um, just in terms of the fact that God made us to be in community. We need to hear it. From another person and when that is not being shared when it is not being said um you know people are remaining in their sin on the top of the page here i have uh, it's the, the 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 jesus prayer um that comes to us from from eastern orthodox uh, uh you know tradition most famously in the um in the uh no the the, the uh the voyage of the, the pilgrim. Lord Jesus, son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And so the need to be able to confess and to be honest with the fact that I am a sinner. And when you think about it, in how many uh, places can we do this? Can we be honest about this? You know, how is sinfulness treated within the communities we belong, within our families? within our neighborhoods, our workplaces, in our churches, or among our buddies. I would say that, that um, they're all going to be quite similar, <laughs> even with the churches. You know, there's a way you act. There's a pattern that you engage in, in terms of your relationship with others. In our families, that goes back decades from our childhoods. Uh, among our buddies, you know, buddies maybe for decades long since school, there's just the pattern and the way you act and, and, and that's the way it's accepted and you might not go any further than that. Well, it'll be that way in churches too. And as we talked about already, you know, do churches tend to model the pious community or the Christian community of sinners Bonhoeffer describes? And I'll leave that up to you to, uh, to ponder. Um, uh, but I know what I've seen and, and what I notice um, in, in our society today. And then in what communities today can we actually find what Bonhoeffer describes being played out, all right? And I got a real good example. And I got a, took a picture from uh, Google 
of such a place, apparently. And that is in uh, the, the regular meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, whether or not you've ever attended a 12-step meeting, stop share here. Whether or not you've ever attended a 12-step meeting or Alcoholics Anonymous or Al-Anon or, or Narcotics Anonymous, whatever it may be, um, it is pretty well known that there is a, a very important practice as to how you enter the community or how you begin. Um, and you begin by saying, hello, my name is Jim. I am an alcoholic, right? Hello, my name is Jim. I'm an alcoholic. It is stating, <laughs> it is stating right from the start, no pretending here. The pretending doesn't work. And for those who are alcoholics, it's been a lifetime of pretending for many of them, and they've gotten real good at it, but they've crashed and burned plenty of times too, or, or they think they're good at it when they're not really as good as they thought, you know, whatever the pattern may be in the community they're a part of. But once you come to AA, it ain't going to work. I am an alcoholic. And I don't know of really any other communities. It ought to be in our churches. Hello, I am Tony and I am a sinner, right? Um, it ought to be there. And in fact, uh, I know uh, John Ortberg, um, who is a, a, a evangelical pastor uh, out in the West Coast. Um, he went through a uh, a practice in a season, and you got this idea from from uh, Dallas Willard actually of a practice of small groups where where in, in supporting one another, not not as an AA meeting, but just as Christians, as a Bible study, a small group ministry. You know, hello, I'm Tony, and I'm a recovering sinner. You know, you know what a practice to uh, to have. Um, and then the idea is. And if you look in that, that picture, again, just as you are. Remember, God knows us only as we really are. Knows us as the, uh, the, the true person that we've been made to be. Um, you know, then finally, healing can happen and you are accepted. Yeah. Um, and so what can we learn and what can we take? from such a community. Well, evil, wickedness, the devil wants us to not have to do any of this, to be any part of this. In confession, there takes place a breakthrough to community. Sin wants to be alone with people. It takes them away from community. The more lonely people become, the more destructive the power of sin over them. The more deeply they become entangled in it, the more unholy is their loneliness. Sin wants to remain unknown. It shuns the light. In the darkness of what is left unsaid, sin poisons the whole being of a person. This can happen in the midst of pious community. And so when you are cut off, and remain alone in whatever are the thoughts just rolling around as the devil is the great accuser. And so the devil will work within our egos, within whatever is going on inside of us and make us convinced about all of our grievances, about all of the ways that we've been wrong, about all kinds of thoughts that are, are awful and wicked, that this ought to be coming to me, that I deserve this, that I deserve that. I'm going to lash out in anger. I'm going to lash out in, uh, in, 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 in contempt. And, um, and the more we stay alone in that, the more awful and unholy it becomes. And it just festers and simmers and festers and is awful. And, and, and what Bonhoeffer says, this happens within pious community. Again, the, the you know the the ego loves the thought oh i'm in community i i'm a, i'm a church goer you know i'm with with people who are very christian 
very holy people. I've been accepted in them, you know. Now, I don't dare let them know what I actually say or how I actually think. I'm not going to do that, you know. But I'm accepted. I belong. I am right. I'm better than others. I'm good in God's eyes, right? Right. In fact, you're more alone and more vulnerable to the unholy developing within you as you are in that pious, unchristian community. And all of it dwells in the midst of darkness. We will keep it hidden. And so I think of the images that are given to us in the Christmas story, the incarnation of God meeting us in our sinful, broken condition, cut off by our own choosing, by our own making, um, from the love and grace of God. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light from the Old Testament prophet Isaiah, right? Or think about this from uh, the Christmas story, actually the birth of John the Baptist to Elizabeth and Zechariah. Uh, Zechariah, who was struck uh, uh, um, you know, mute, he could not speak uh, when, he, when, he, when he doubted the fact that uh, his way beyond childbearing years wife is going to have a, have a son, um, he struck mute. Um, but after the birth of John, um, his first words are this, are what are known as the Benedictus, the song of Zechariah from Luke chapter one. Notice the relationship between forgiveness and light and remaining in our sins and darkness. All right. This is the end of the Benedictus. And you, child, will be called a prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the forgiveness of their sins, by the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. This, uh, you know, I mean, think about everything we talked about here today and, and even throughout, you know, the, the life together and how it is all summed up here at the end of the song of Zechariah. Knowledge of salvation. So I talked about salvation as, as you seeing yourself as God sees you, you know, and that's with complete, absolute love, just as you are. And the forgiveness of sins makes that possible for us. Not so that now, you know, we can get our ticket to heaven, but, but so that now we can live, move, breathe, dwell as God sees us in unity with God for eternity. And that means now too, eternity is now in session. As what? Because of God's mercy, yes. So the dawn... The sun rising from on high will break upon us to give light to those who are sitting in darkness. That is to light to those who are dwelling in this sin and denial and the facades and the phoniness and whatever it is. You know, that's the shadow of death. And, and when finally we are freed and liberated from all that, we can walk in the way of peace. We can be, you know, we're again free to live and reflect the spiritual love that makes us completely vulnerable. Oh boy, are we, we open, um, but it's okay because we're held in the presence of God. So we will finish next time um, taking a look at the rest of this chapter, Confession and the Lord's Supper. Uh, there are four breakthroughs. Uh, we talked about a breakthrough to community here today, but there are four of them. Breakthrough to the cross, to new life, and to assurance. Um, well, what were a breakthrough from what? You know, and 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 how are they related? So think about that. Um, you know, what what happens when what has remained in darkness is now brought into the light? We kind of gave you that answer already. 
Um, so humility, how does humility play in all of this? Um, got a little bit of a foretaste of what I will be doing after life together in this statement from page 91. Confession is following after, following after Jesus and following Christ. Nachfolge in German. What does that mean? Recall the lessons of Alcoholics Anonymous. How can they be used in some of our other communities? And then how is Holy Communion related to this? You know, we haven't heard a thing yet about the Lord's Supper. Communion plays a pretty central role in our life together as in worship. Um, and it is for us as Lutherans, and maybe even more so for our, our Catholic brothers and sisters. So how is that related? Anyhow, a lot of good stuff here today. And I'm just thrilled to be able to look at these pages and just about share with them uh, with you verbatim, as Bonhoeffer gives it to us in the beginning of this chapter. Much for us to ponder, but it's worth our pondering. Can we be real? Can we be honest that we are sinners? And so that's a challenge for me as an individual. But then how about the community? Can the community be mature and draw from grace enough to be a safe place for real people to come and be honest. I mean, you got to think about that as well. I sure hope so. And uh, through grace and through Jesus, it is all possible. So thank you for this time together. Be at peace. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God.